the panel discussion. And, um, and it's my honor to welcome the moderators, Dr. Pradeepa Pereira and Dr. Shilpa Avrjibin. Dr. Pradeepa Pereira is professor and HOD for the Department of Geriatric Medicine at JSS Medical College and head of the Department of Quality and CCRA at Research Center. Madam has completed her MD, MD in general medicine from KMC Mangalore and also super specialized in geriatric medicine. She is a member of ethics committee at JSS, chairman ethics committee for Court Dental College, committee member of ICMR for review and revision of ethical guidelines. She is an NABH assessor, technical head for NABH EC accreditation. We welcome you, ma'am. Along uh, with Dr. You. Pere yeah. Huh. Huh. Along with Dr. Pereira, we have Dr. Shilpa joining us. Dr. Shilpa Avribel, she is an associate professor from the Department of Geriatric Medicine at JSS Medical College, Mangalore, Mysore. She has completed her DNP program in uh, internal medicine and thereafter postgraduate diploma in general geriatric medicine, including a fellowship in geriatrics from Royal College of Physicians. She's a PhD scholar on clusters in multimorbidity. And she had been a principal investigator for COVID vaccine trials and has many publications to her credit. Won many awards. Few to mention are in the year 2022, she was awarded as Young Scholar of 2022 by Indian Academy of Geriatrics. And then the Best Role Model Award from Wessex UK, Best Paper Award, Best Teacher Award, etc. Welcome to you, ma'am. And requesting Madam Shilpa to present the introduced panelists. Yes. Thank you I very much for that wonderful introduction. Forward for this panel. Uh, Shilpa will introduce and she will take forward uh, the panel discussion. And at the end, I'll come back uh, to close the panel discussion. Shilpa, over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you once again. Um, before we begin, I once again thank Pratiba, ma'am, and uh, the Kahu committee members for giving me this wonderful full opportunity. Uh, short of time, uh, I would like to begin with the introduction of the panel discussion. Uh, we have Dr. Kaushik Dasar, Prabha Adhikari ma'am, Dr. Pritesh Rohan sir, Janet Mathias from uh, Jesus Hospital, Sheila madam uh, with us as the panelist. Uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Kaushik Ranjan Dath sir, uh, he has uh, completed his MBBS, DFFM, DGC, multiple fellowships and also a certificate course in geriatric medicine, clinical cardiology, psychiatry, psychosexual disorder and dementia. He is presently a consultant family physician and geriatrician from Nehru Memorial Teaching Global Hospital, Apollo Clinic, Barakpur, Sharada Multi-Speciality Hospital, uh, Barakpur. He has been immediate past president of the Geriatric Society of India, patron of JSI West Bengal, He's a national advisor for Indian Journal of uh, Geriatric Care. He is also conceptualized and edited uh, the book's title, Non-Clinical Frontiers in Geriatric Care. He has got 12 chapters to his credit, a guide for a geriatric social worker caregiver, and it's, he's got 13 chapters. He's also a faculty of GSI certificate course in geriatrics and gerontology for version one and two. Uh, I welcome Dr. Kaushik Ranjan that, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, um, it's my pleasure to have Dr. Prabha Hadikari, ma'am, who is professor and HOD of geriatric medicine from Yenupoya Medical College. Um, I have personally met her, heard her classes. She is an excellent teacher. Uh, she's finished her MBBS from KMC Hubli, and she's got uh, distinction, MD general medicine from KMC Mangalore mentor for Mangalore Alzheimer's Association. To brief about her former positions, she has been a research director from Kasturba Medical College, former uh, HOD of uh, medicine department in KMC, and uh, Dr. TMA Pai Endowment Chair in Geriatrics and Gerontology from Manipal University. She's uh, also been in charge of diabetes clinic, and she's been actively involved in setting up seven centers for diabetes care for older people uh, and it, it runs free of cost. Uh, she runs a geriatric and a private diabetes clinic, Priya Diabetic Clinic. I welcome Dr. Prabhadikari, ma'am. Okay, ma'am, good evening. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a privilege to um, welcome Dr. Pritesh Rohan, sir. Uh, 
it's it's a brief introduction that he is presently working as an associate professor in department of community medicine at St John's Medical College. He has been he has finished his internship from Kims and he has been working with uh, St John's for a long time. Uh, he has got multiple accomplishments under him. To brief about it due to time constraints, he has got more than fifty publications, both national and international. He has been awarded from Government of Karnataka in twenty. 21 as a covid warrior and uh, he has got covid or warrior award from deccan herald healing hands for the year 2020 and he has been conferred with vayu shrestha samman award which was awarded by the president of india in recognition of his service to senior citizens in the year 2021 he has been member of various state national advisory boards and forums for senior citizens members of various policy making bodies at state national and international le um, levels uh, it's a privilege to have dr pratish sir as one of the panelists because we'll definitely have more more ideas on what best we all can do uh, as a group i welcome dr pratish sir for the panel discussion thank you dr shilpa thank you uh, i would like to introduce uh, sister janet mathias she is can i have the next slide please yeah she is chief of nursing services at jesus hospital uh, she has completed her msc in nursing in medical surgical nursing with neuro nursing specialty in the year 2006 she has worked as a nursing tutor assistant professor associate from 93 to 2013 She's been into nursing administration since February 2014. And I'm very happy to uh, have been working with her for more than a decade. And she's more, she's a very dedicated, uh, she's very dedicated and she's very supportive to the junior doctors, senior doctors, and most of our colleagues. Uh, it's a privilege to have uh, Sister Janet Mathias as one of the panelists. I welcome you, Sister. Welcome to Janet Mathias, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Shilpa, madam. I'm uh, honored. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's a privilege to have uh, Madam Sheila MS, who has completed BSc in PCM and she has done her master's MA in uh, from Karnataka State Open University. She has worked as a teacher for more than two decades and she has been a special educator for learning disability clinic. Now she is an active homemaker and she is actively involved in caregiver for dementia patients for more than eight years. Uh, I welcome Sheila, madam. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. So with all the panelists, uh, short of time, I would like to take five minutes of all before the discussion begins. I'll share a short case scenario and then we'll take the discussion uh, from uh, there onwards. So uh, we had an aged Mrs. A who was 82 year old. She presented with symptoms suggestive of lower respiratory tract infection. Um, in, and this was there for the past one week. At arrival to the emergency department, she was in respiratory distress and she was in need of ventilator support. She was accompanied by a caregiver and brought to, brought to the hospital by an ambulance. Son lives in US and not much of past history was available at the time of arrival. The emergency department resident intubated her in view of impending respiratory distress sent routine investigation and she was transferred to the geriatric care once she was stabilized initially. And the caregiver consent was taken before the initial measures were done. An hour after the admission, her son spoke to the resident on call and mentioned that his mother had history of multiple myeloma. She did complete her chemotherapy, however, she was bedridden due to significant back pain for more than two years. And son seemed not much satisfied. Rather, he was not happy about the decision taken by the treating team to put his mom on ventilator. So this is a scenario which we all as the treating physicians, geriatricians, emergency department, and some similar uh, uh, scenarios are what we come across in our day-to-day -day practice. With this, can I have the next slide? So now at presently, ma'am, can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you. So the patient is presently on ventilator. 
she does she sedated but yes she does respond to oral commands her bp is maintaining with the support of inotropes she is on iv antibiotics and the supportive care her sensorium has improved however it was difficult to get her off the ventilator she did continue for more than 7 days on day 11 the team did discuss about the tracheostomy because looks like she she was ventilator dependent and this was discussed with the family over the phone so now we have the important issues which we all face one medically yes there is difficulty to wean her off from the ventilator with the background of uh, multiple myeloma and she has been having recurrent pneumonia bedridden for quite some time for more than 2 years very frail and sarcopenic so these are the medical issues um, she is facing and we have some social issues here at the moment uh, her son is not with her she is taken care by the caregiver and of course the financial support is provided by the son who lives in abroad now ethical issues as a treating uh, doctor a uh, junior residents and this treating geriatrician how valid is the phone consent because everything has been conveyed to the son over the phone and of course there was a uh, how what is the role of the carer in this uh, consent so to begin with the question uh, to prabhadi kari ma'am ma'am could you please highlight uh, few points on what is the importance of informed consent and ethical issues in the consenting process is consent taken over the phone considered legally valid over to dr prabha ma'am yeah uh, if you are talking about uh, consent with reference to care of the patient in an emergency situation telephonic uh, consent is absolutely valid to put the patient on the ventilator however it has to be authenticated by a proper documentation within 24 hours that means if the son if you had to ask the son uh, if you could connect immediately that is when we j- just had less than 4 minutes to decide whether patient should go on a ventilator if you could connect to him and get his approval telephonically uh, we could have gone ahead with the process but however the son was not in the picture Uh, the caregiver has brought the patient without any history and in this situation whatever ed has done is appropriate that as doctors we are not the ones to decide uh, what to do and what not to do and we are only here to give care the emergency department's primary duty is to save lives and they have done the job so that that there is absolutely no second thought about it we don't think whether they have money whether the patient is frail whether the patient will survive whether the patient will go on a ventilator forever we can't make the decision in the 4 minutes we have because this is a severely hypoxic patient and i think oh, the time the ed had was less than 4 minutes so absolutely fine with what they have done but after putting the patient on the ventilator when things settle probably if the son wanted to speak to the doctor he could have spoken and the doctor could have explained the situation it was uh, in this scenario the person calls the next day after the patient yes. is already put on ventilator everything has been stabilized he is accusing the doctor for doing something which is not legal which is absolutely uh, not correct because it's absolutely legal as per indian law we are absolutely fine with ventilating anybody who comes to the ed irrespective of the status of the patient because we do not have any um, legal uh, permission for advanced di- directive first of all this patient didn't have anything to of yes. advanced directive first of all it is not valid even if she had because at that point again we have to confirm it so yes. whatever she has done is absolutely fine telephone consent for care is permissible but not for withdrawing the support that we have already given even that 11 days support oh. if son says withdraw we cannot withdraw because that becomes legal we need to consent the ethics committee uh, of the institution and have a legal person who will document opinion of the patient although patient is on a ventilator uh, check whether she will be able to say yes or no in some way first take patient's opinion 
then the then sun comes secondary because its patient's opinion is what matters the patient came in distress to the casualty asking for help and the whatever the team has done is a wonderful job of stabilizing the patient that's what i would say as per the law of india okay ma'am so uh, to summarize yes we can go ahead for emergency care and phone consent but however withdrawing life support uh, is not possible just over the phone and we need to have a legal system involved yes. thank you ma'am thank you for that um i now have my next question uh, to to dr kaushik das sir uh, sir could you uh, throw some light on importance of social assessment in elderly and its implication and uh, would you suggest any formal training uh, to address social issues um kaushik das sir uh, am i audible i think he is muted madam Oh, now am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> okay, yes, at sir. first, I expressed my gratitude uh, for uh, taking me in this panel discussion. So, in the in this case uh, and related to this case, you have asked the importance of social assessment in elderly and its implication. I shall touch at first the social connection. Social connection. is a core human need you know core human need and the desire for to, desire to be connected is also a fundamental desire this is the human being's nature what happens if there is lack of social connection this lack of social connection we can say it as loneliness this affects triggers inflammation accelerates accelerates aging that the uh, worsens cardiovascular problems even suicide and alter mortality is increased due, due to lack of social connected connections this assessment of socio economic status of the elderly is an integral part of geriatric assessment if we and if we do not assess the socio economic status of an elderly then the management of the elderly patient will remain incomplete yes what are the areas of social important social aspects social aspects to be uh, seen then first of all the role of the patient in the family then the his living arrangement his or her interaction with family members his or her status in the society his financial aspects also included in the socio economic status also environment in build and the natural environment environment within the house and outside is also an important part of socio socio economic assessment of an elderly so in our country the geriatric medicine all the elderly care system has not yet developed to a where high that persons are getting care according to the principle and practices of geriatric care so this there are multiple comorbidities in a geriatric patient uh, they were required to be managed or helped by trained personnel what kind of training geriatric care training a geriatric a professional geriatric care giver can do a mile in the in promoting the quality promoting the health of the elderly and improving the quality of life of an elderly what a geriatric social worker can do he will assess the condition of a patient whenever he will go to the house of that fresh person will assess the condition who see he will see who is the doctor what is the, what are the medicines that are that are being prescribed to him or her and what are the doses are the medicines that are taken by the patient rightly or not then comes the home environment of the home that comes with if there is other family members 
then what is his relation with the family members? If they passes quality family time or not, what is the home, home environment? That is, it is the home environment, I think, the, whether the home is elderly friendly or not. Then also regarding social connections, he, can, he will find out whether the person is socially connected or not. And there are also matters of elderly abuses that can be evident uh, through conversation in front of that caregiver. He can address diplomatically the situation. Yes. So these are the areas. And also he has some role in counseling the patient, counseling the family members, and also training the persons to know some technical devices. You know, social media can help a lot in making the person socially connected. So this person, this okay. caregiver, can train that person to be trained in doing the social media activities. And also this caregiver is, this. you should consider that this caregiver is the is like the son or close relative of that person. In our present case, this, this caregiver has taken the role of son. He has given consent, etc. So this caregiver is very much important in geriatric care. Oh. And without caregiver, okay. without social assessment, assessment, this will affect the quality of life. Of our so thank you for this. Thank you, sir. So to put it in a nutshell, uh, Kaushik Das said that it, this suggests that social uh, assessment is a must. It is incomplete uh, CGA if we do not do a social assessment. And training will definitely help us to connect the physicians, doctor, uh, doctor treating doctors, and the family as well as the uh, uh, caregiver uh, to have a good connectivity. Thank you, sir. With this, uh, I go ahead with my next question uh, to Madam uh, Janet. Uh, geriatric nursing care and needs. Uh, Gracie's uh, sister has given a good insight to that. Uh, to add on, what aspects need special training? And uh, Madam, do you suggest a formal geriatric nursing care training programs? And uh, how do you think we can uh, come up with that? Uh, yes, Madam Shilpa. Uh, geriatric nursing care needs some special training. And uh, uh, since I have, uh, for more than two decades, I was uh, in the nursing education side, every step of nursing education, like the procedures we demonstrate in the beginning, or the advanced nursing practices we teach in the later uh, years of training in the basic nursing training, elderly care also is included there. But it was it is not given much importance. Suppose if you go for medical surgical nursing and all, they teach only about the adult nursing care. Specific mm. geriatric care, like very elderly aged one, like sensory changes, locomotion changes, what we do very superficially. I do suggest that uh, specific or a formal geriatric nursing uh, training is a must, is a need of the art these days, especially. Uh, and uh, that should be, uh, I don't suggest that it should have, if we have a post-basic diploma in geriatric care and all that suggested by the Indian Nursing Council and all those things, but every institution where they have a separate geriatric specialty or uh, uh, bigger hospitals like uh, on the job training and the certificate course uh, we can initiate. And uh, that, is a, that is very much needed. That is what I feel. Uh, Madam Gracie's uh, presentation, uh, elaborately, she said so yes. many assessment tools and all. That is one part of it. And the medication management, because uh, there is a vast change in the normal adult. And as the person yes. ages, its physiology changes. So the needs changes. As well. So we have to see comprehensively, like uh, social support, caregiver support, and all those things changes because they are mostly they are dependent, uh, especially if not physically all the time, emotionally and uh, uh, like memory and all those things are needed. So specific prescribed training, I do suggest it's required. Oh. 
thank you thank you sister thank you so much uh, so emphasizing the fact that there is uh, there is a training which does speak about uh, geriatric nursing but uh, madam does emphasize that there is no much of importance given in the formal nursing training but yes she um, as majority of us suggest that yes there is a for requirement for a formal training programs now uh, sheila madam i would like to uh, re- i would request you to highlight on what would be the carer perspective see we all speak about what, how doctors treat how a nursing hello uh, staff treats and what we have to do in the hospital but then uh, uh, what we, we we hardly give much importance to what ha- have to the carer point of view so please uh, enlighten us on the carer perspective and also a note on a caregiver burden over to sheila madam hello yeah ma'am you are audible uh, good evening everybody yes ma'am you are audible uh, as you said the carer is the least bothered person in this whole scenario he shall, he or she is not ever not at all taken uh, any uh, importance at all they take it and especially if it's a woman in this particular case if the caregiver is from a from some agency let us say there will not be much uh, psychological burden on that caregiver because she is not related to the patient but if the patient daughter comes in the burden is the maximum as seen the son is in us giving money that's all but everything that has to be handled all decisions made will be by the daughter and chances of they uh, making comments is also more so the caregivers burden is psychologically very much and one should understand she also has a family she also has a husband wife husband children in laws when such is the case and as you say if that mother is 80 her father in law mother in law will also be in 80s and if they are there she has to take care of her in laws she can't just leave them and run away and she has to take care of her career if she is employed somewhere and she has to take care of the mother who is admitted and if it's the same place for example both are living in the same city then it's something if they are living in two different cities that is a bigger headache here the social setup comes into a great play that patient sister brother somebody can manage for a day or two so that she can arrange something in her house and then come over because these patients will not take immediately they will not become all right they will take 8 days 10 days 12 days and even after they come back home also they need yeah. care so the carer burden is something that has to be taken into consideration where I, but as i see as i am in this i see nobody bothers and especially if it's a woman what else she has she has to take care because she inherits something so let her do it that sort of an attitude is developed that should go i think this uh, setup looks like carer will also get some respect and some um, what would you say some consideration in the society the burden is very much okay yes yes thank you ma'am um you. yeah and as ma'am rightly said yes i think uh, the previous presentation by surekha ma'am did mention about uh, a multidisciplinary team approach i think that should add on uh, to the counseling for the caregiver so that that is a point we could uh, make a note of so now we have uh, dr pritish sir who has been into uh, community uh, work and he has been working as community geriatrician so with that uh, sir could you please uh, mention about the significance of community geriatrician and their role in decreasing the hospital admissions and in the above case, case scenario uh, do you think as a community geriatrician the line of management the planning would have been different over to pritesh sir right uh, so thank you shilpa and uh, uh, i'd like to thank the organizers uh, for this opportunity uh, let's first look at this term community geriatricians 
Now, uh, as far as the community geriatrician is concerned, it's not somebody you know who's actually just working in the community, but any physician with whom uh, this you know, particular patient comes in contact with before admission to the hospital. So what is very important is that uh, the community uh, geriatrician or the personal physician of uh, this particular person needs to explain certain things you know, to the older person. The aspect of multimorbidity, you know, needs to be clearly uh, mentioned. Uh, the aspect of you no know, polypharmacy with the you know prescribing cascade, which is uh, something you know very important, uh, needs to be emphasized. And uh, the aspect of you no know, adherence to medications needs to be you know actually something that's you no know, emphasized upon. But what is also needed to be seen is the component of affordability, the component of you no know, cost. In this particular case, you know, we are saying that the son of the patient is somewhere in the U.S. Now, the son of the you know, patient may somewhere be in the U.S., but we don't know what exactly you know, the person is working as. He may be working as a janitor you know, in a school wherein the cost <laughs> of uh, this kind of treatment out here you know, is very, very, uh, uh, I mean, ex uh, exorbitant, even though you know, we think that the person you know, is somewhere in the U.S. What is the familial support system? Uh, this is something that, you know, the community geriatrician needs to actually assess and uh, look at in terms of who are the various family members that, you know, come forward. Who is it that uh, the uh, physician needs to explain to with regard to the condition of, you know, this particular patient? What are some of the social support mechanisms that are available? When I say social support mechanisms in terms of uh, well-wishers, friends, in terms of you know, insurance systems, uh, in terms of uh, neighbors. So uh, these are you know, very important components for us to actually look at as geriatricians and then possibly look at decisions you know, taken as far as older people are concerned. We also need to look at various psychosocial issues. We have uh, issues such as autonomy where uh, older people nowadays you know, have decision making in order to be able to say that we do not want any kind of uh, advanced you know, intervention. Uh, they can give you know, advanced directives well in advance and we need to respect you know, some of these you know, components. We need to also look at if family members collectively can actually express this you know, particular advanced directive you know, from uh, a particular older person who is actually uh, saying that they do not want any kind of you no know, intubation, or they, they do not want any kind of you no know, major uh, interventions, you no know, that are there as far as end of life is concerned. So, what is you know very important is that there is a clear communication that's you know required as far as patients and their family is concerned, and uh, this I think needs to be ingrained in every geriatrician, in every you know I mean uh, physician who is actually you know taking care of uh, older people. And as people dealing with the elderly, you know, in the community as such, we would, I think, you know, need to be very accommodating as far as the wishes of patients and their family is concerned. What is also very important, lastly, is a very close follow-up uh, with, you know, whatever we actually advise. Uh, let's say, you know, that there is a, a patient who actually gives some sort of a directive that is, uh, that looks at a rider the patient says, okay, fine, you intubate, but beyond, you know, I mean, two or three days, kindly, you know, ensure that my family is not inconvenienced. If, if something like that actually is very clearly mentioned by an older person, uh, I think, you know, we as care providers need to know, ensure that these kind of directives are kept in mind. And uh, we take the necessary actions in order to be able to prevent any kind of burden as far as, you know, the older person or the family is concerned. Oh. Okay, sir. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So, uh, just a quick question. As a community geriatrician, it's out of my um, uh, curiosity. Do you usually discuss about the social issues and also the advanced care directive? And do you do you keep a record of that so that suppose they are getting to a hospital in an emergency situation, uh, do they contact you? Yes. Uh, so we have something called the home health service where. We have a lot of older persons who are not in a position to come across to hospital. Most of them are you now bed bound, bedridden. Uh, there are people you know who actually uh, 
are are currently uh, quite you know cognitively you know fine but uh, they are not in a position to actually come across the hospital or to possibly a legal person to give uh, such kind of an advanced directive so uh, we do ask such you know patients uh, some of these aspects and some of them do uh, keep you know certain things in writing or convey to their physicians uh, well in advance in case they are coming across st johns uh, that they do not wish any kind of you no know, advanced uh, interventions you not know, to be uh, undertaken you know, in the yeah, terminal phase they can uh, sit and go through here only but... uh, so shilpa does that answer your question Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, ma'am. Should we take up these questions uh, in the end? Because okay, in the end, in the end, you can take up. Yes. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so I have my next question to uh, uh, Prabhati Kari, ma'am. Again, ma'am. Um, uh, it would be really helpful if you could uh, give us few points on geriatric palliative care. Uh, Prabha, Prabha ma'am, I think you're muted, ma'am. Sorry. Yeah. So first of all, uh, uh, the doctors themselves don't understand the term palliative care. Everybody thinks that uh, loving the patient to die peacefully is palliative care. So uh, all uh, I get references from medicine department for palliative care. Patient is almost about to die, as so though to die with us, they are transmitting. So palliative care is a care that geriatric patients should get from day one to until the end of their life. So it definitely addresses all their problems, social, psychological, physical, uh, uh, and uh, any other issues that are there with the patient. So uh, when we address, when we just address their physical symptoms, um, they will not get the comfort. So when we start addressing all, look look at all their symptoms and start giving symptomatic treatment as well as address all their uh, psychological issues and social issues and even spiritual issues, uh, they, will be, they, they will be very much at peace and uh, they will understand what is the goal of care and how uh, they will be able to even take decision. So that should start from the day we see a geriatric patient, the palliative care concept of the disease. So um, some people may think it is a sort of a non-scientific uh, treatment because when we go with the palliative care approach, my goal is to make the patient as comfortable as possible at the within the shortest possible time. So I don't worry about what uh, is the underlying cause of pain, then only I will find a painkiller and give the patient. I will relieve the pain of the patient immediately. If somebody is dysnic, I will immediately relieve the difficulty in breathing without thinking about what could have caused it. So that is palliative care. And uh, in geriatric, uh, actually the, there are no clear cut um, uh, rules in geriatric palliative care. Whereas in a cancer palliative care, we have very clear cut rules and regulations, we can have advanced directive, we can decide not to do certain things because the life is limited there. In cancer, we know patient has got an end-stage cancer and the life of the patient is going to last only for less than six months. There, the decisions are easy, no putting the patient on ventilator or whatever. But in geriatric palliative care, um, after a uh, disease is incurable, for example, dementia, Patient may live for 20 years also. So how yes. ethical is it to withhold some treatment from such a patient? Yes. Again, um, uh, we have all end-stage diseases like end-stage lung disease, end-stage kidney disease, end-stage heart disease, and uh, all the uh, neurological stroke patients who are on the bed. Uh, so uh, each patient and each family has a different. Suppose say yes. it was my father. I would want my father at whatever uh, state he is, even if he is bedridden, even if he is not able to cognitively think, the father was very important for all of us, the children as well as for my mother. As long as he was there, the house was happy. So, whereas another patient, okay, 
who yes. has cognitively impaired, physically impaired, nobody to care for. Like one USA son who just uh, connects with him once in a blue moon, that too to check whether he's alive or dead. So in such a situation, the goals are different because the, the, the patient himself may, may not feel like living. He may not want his life to be extended. As long as there are loving people to care for, the life can be extended to any length of time. As long as he is not in severe pain, he is not panting for breath, as long as we can control those symptoms, I think the goal of care uh, can be uh, whatever the patient and the family members wish in a particular case. Uh, so that concept of geriatric palliative care is not there. Because now in state renal disease, we have dialysis option. Every nook and corner of the country has free dialysis facilities. So we cannot withhold a dialysis from a uh, frail geriatric patient. We have to give that option. And uh, in an acute kidney injury, we will dialyze a patient. And then think of how to arrange for dialysis for the patient. In stage lung disease, okay. we have devices now. So that okay. is it. So, however, uh, the training for geriatric palliative care in India is lacking. So with that in mind, Johan Becker met us sometime in 2014 in a conference. He came from Germany. He trains doctors in geriatric palliative care in Germany. And he thought India is a rich place because nobody is trained. And he went from college to college. He could not start the geriatric palliative care course. And uh, I was able to start the course in Manipal University. And now I have started the course in um, uh, uh, Yenapaya University as well. A certificate program to sensitize people on the needs of the geriatric patients needing Yenapaya. palliative okay. Okay, um, and the geriatric departments are there, there are about 18 colleges. However, um, uh, the palliative care approach I have seen in only few of the colleges. Sure. They do practice okay. palliative care. Um, thank you very much, ma'am. That was a wonderful enlightenment on, uh, there's a gray area between end of life and palliative. As you rightly said, people usually mistake uh, palliative for end of life. Uh, we all have to rethink about that. So my next question to Kaushik Das, sir, sir home-based training to tackle social aspect, where do we stand? You did mention, yes, a uh, lot of applications and we can connect uh, through app-based, but uh, do we have anything as of now? Uh, so where do we stand in home-based training, sir? Your, uh, your say on that. Okay, thank you. In, in our healthcare delivery system, there are government level healthcare delivery system there are private healthcare delivery system, including corporates uh, and other private agencies, so NGOs, or even uh, at their own privately, the healthcare delivery system has been running in India. In our primary healthcare system, elements of primary healthcare, geriatric care, elderly care has not been included not been included in the primary health care, elements of primary health care. That is a very much needed thing. You know, the decade of healthy aging is, has been running since last year, and it will continue up to 2030. They have given important to international bonding, even given to primary health care and the preventive care also. But still, in our country, this geriatric care or elderly care has not yet been included in the primary health care, elements of primary health care. Next point, we have government level have lots of workers at the village level. These are known as ASHA workers. They go to the doorstep of the persons regularly and collects, collects information regarding the health status of a person and also records it and also supplies some medicines and also provides counseling. If the ASHA workers been trained in geriatric know-how, they could uh, change the scenario to a much extent, to a large extent uh, in home care system. Then in India, some corporates have developed their home care services with partially trained or untrained personnel. They are only to take profit from that. 
they are, they are only to snatch money from the our the soft target and the people <clears throat> and at organization level and even at personal level the genetic physician or the person interested or enjoy interesting genetic care has running training of genetic caregivers that is formal training formal training of caregivers has been running to a less very little extent with the genetic society of india West Bengal branch of last day, last day training, we have, it is, has been running continuously online pre-recorded video training program where faculties from all over India of the Genetic Society of India are faculty of the training program. It is continuing in, from Kolkata. Okay. So okay. Huh, these are the things and this the two, uh, and also other programs for the Minister of Social Justice and Empowerment. They have launched an online training program in the name of TAPOS, TAPS, probably. And there are also offline training programs for their region, RRTCs. These are the situation present, but this, the uh, number of persons coming out of this such kind of training is much less, to the, less than the requirement. So training should be intensified for all level all the professional bodies should think of it. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I have a question now to uh, Janet, madam. Ma'am, we all know uh, in abroad, nurse practitioners do play a vital role in connecting patients, their families and primary physicians and uh, hospitals. So what you say, are we in India or locally, are we prepared to train and enroll nursing practitioners to our system, at least to treat the geriatric patients? your input ma'am yes madam shilpa uh, like uh, in uh, yeah, us and all the the developed uh, western world like uh, nurses in the healthcare system healthcare delivery system they have a different system or whatsoever but they nurses play an important role and uh, quite a professional independent role and they are licensed to practice and they are a liaison between all the time patients will not come to the hospital or always they know, do not need uh, doctors to be consulted. They run their clinic, etc. Okay. Whereas India is concerned, uh, nurse practitioner is gaining momentum now. As on now mm -hmm. in India, nurse practitioner in critical care nursing, critical care nursing, where in the okay. ICUs most of the time due to the dearth of doctors and all those things, in especially in government setups, like though we have equipments and ICUs, there are no personnel like. So to bring up that into that, nurse practitioner in critical care nursing is uh, introduced. That is also in its infancy now because uh, uh, clear cut uh, this one syllabus is designed somehow and uh, their pattern like they should be working continuously in ICU for two years, then they give a master's degree and all. What if after that, like, you know, like, uh, as you said, independent practitioner, like what, who will protect them legally? or uh, under whose guidance they have to practice, all these things are not yet settled. It's in the infancy. They are, discussions are going on, nurse practitioners. Okay. And uh, when, okay. as far as uh, geriatric systems and care of the elderly is concerned, uh, as all of us must agree, a nurse can do much uh, much more in the community or do the settings. As the earlier speaker Correct. said, that all the time yes. the elderly cannot come to the uh, institution or the hospital like and many of their needs can be met with a well-trained uh, senior nurse who can manage with the procedures independently at home and similarly she has good professional knowledge which can communicate back yes. to the geriatrician etc as we do at our institution madam shilpa yes okay. Okay. thank you sister thank you so much i now have a quick question to uh, sheila madam uh, madam can you please tell us about how common uh, uh, do you have you seen the physical and uh, mental abuse in elderly and uh, what are the steps to prevent it can i have the next slide ma'am yeah it's more of elderly abuse, physical and mental. How common have you encountered and uh, like what are the steps to prevent? See, elderly abuse is totally in-house. The uh, elderly is in the house. The people around them, the son, the daughter-in-law, the grandchildren, the daughter, son-in-laws, 
they abuse the elderly because they feel this elderly is taking on my money i have to waste money on this person this should go for this to go you need very much of um, uh, attention or anything but here what happens as i saw we i advise the people in the house saying that it is not ethical on your part you god will punish you that this everything we have told and tell told that you should not you should take care of your parents fine they said okay fine they just listen and go back home and abuse the elderly more this is i don't know how to take care of but here one thing as i have seen the elderly should be firstly they should be uh, encouraged to keep a contact with their people and yes. have some money for themselves so oh yes. this is my son let me give me let me give him all the money let me give him the mom house everything no at any cost they should be trained not to do this this they must be trained they must be told in their 60s 70s once they cross 70 this very and unfortunately the children at home they pick the mobile and they don't allow the elderly to talk in the phone they constrict the elder this is definitely not good so meetings should be held and they should be trained that so that they become more aware of what is happening if they have a house of own they should be the owner of the house they somehow they can manage at least they can rent it out and live in a uh, assisted home but if the house is given to the children they will have nothing financially they must have their money that is the first thing but abuse inside the house we can't do anything as i have seen we cannot do anything it is only outside we can tell and uh, other things we can this should come at an earlier stage once the person retires once the person here for this the best thing would be go to temples where you have a congregation of women and men who are more than 65 70 years old and of course here caregiver also abused okay. because i being a caregiver i have seen this abuse also the men folk when they are let us say he has got stroke and he is bedridden oh he is a man i am a man i have earned money it is the duty of my my, my wife to look after me and then he beats her he just pushes her he just throws the uh, food that is given to him this unfortunately the doctor advised that lady you once he does that you just leave that if at all he has thrown away the breakfast don't give him breakfast till lunch he has to suffer by by doing that that man came into uh, some sort of a, a reconciliation yeah. that yes i cannot <laughs> be my wife the other yes. portion is you you are treating a person now since i am with dementia patients i see the dementia patient does not want to bath they don't want to brush you tell them they beat they, it is not that they want to beat it personally but they don't want to yes. be disturbed so they just push once they push we fall down because we are in in that imbalance we may fall down and we may get hurt so there are all three types of things are and of course if the patient is not able to remember they beat the servants if yeah. you ask the servant to do it they beat but how to control it's very difficult one person in charge must continuously be on the role so that that man woman is taken care Okay. So that i think uh, uh, one should yes ma'am yeah <laughs> yes this this does give us um, uh, insight into what happens in inside the house uh, ha- yeah. with uh, with these remarks uh, i think uh, dr priteshir could give us uh, a few uh, government has come up with few things which can uh, which help us and guide us to uh, treat this aspects or uh, Uh, highlight these aspects in a better way so from uh, my uh, last question to pritesh sir is what are the community services provided uh, 
and uh, present government uh, schemes and policies and uh, your inputs on how to set up a community geriatric programs i think my second question on how do we set up a community geriatric programs which would be more of a multidisciplinary one which will definitely focus on care caregiver burden elderly abuse preventive aspects so can we have your inputs on this sir Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shilpa. Uh, let's look at the uh, first bit. Uh, in terms of, you know, the first bit as such, we have quite a few programs, you know, from the uh, government of India. Uh, to start with, we have what's called the national policy for older persons. So the national policy for older persons, you know, was outlined, you know, quite long time ago in 1999, and uh, thereafter, you know, there have been various ratifications over the years. The most recent, you know, being uh, around a decade ago, and uh, this national policy for older persons puts out the various components that requires for the government to actually do for you know, older persons. Right? This is in line with the international uh, requirements or conventions uh, which have looked at the rights, you know, for older persons. Um, in line with the national policy for older persons. Uh, which was there sometime, you know, in 1999 and thereafter in 2004, uh, the government set up a program called the National Program for the Healthcare of the Elderly. And this National Program for the Healthcare of the Elderly is like any other national program. When we talk of, you know, the tuberculosis program or, you know, the uh, program for maternal and child health. So this is a program that's meant for senior citizens. That's, you know, people above the age of 60 years. But unfortunately, this particular program has not been rolled out completely across the country. It's very active, you know, at a, at a state level, at a district level. But uh, when we actually come down to the primary health center level, right? So the primary health center level where you're looking at the PHC and, you know, a number of villages which actually cover uh, the elderly population, there is a requirement, you know, for uh, this particular program to provide uh, once weekly clinics for older people, right? So dedicated okay. once weekly clinics, you know, need to be conducted by the PHCs, older people. Similarly, we have the sub-center level, which looks at maybe around five to six villages, a 5,000 population at a village level. And uh, this sub-center level, uh, the a &M as well as you no know, other functionaries required to actually provide home-based care for older people, you know, in their own homes. So especially domiciliary care for people who cannot come across to the hospital. So I think it's very important for us to be able to realize some of these schemes that are there, the NPHC especially, and ensure that uh, this is actually implemented across the state and across the country, starting from the very uh, village level and not just you know, from the district or from the state level. Now, coming back to what you mentioned about the care of you know, senior citizens in terms of their rights, there is something called the Maintenance of Senior Citizens Act. And this Maintenance of you know, Senior Citizens Act actually looks at the caregivers, children you know, of uh, senior citizens, actually taking care of their elderly parents or elderly uh, people at home. And in case you know, they actually fail to do so, or in case you know, there is any kind of a a legal contravention in this regard. In case there's anything like uh, elder abuse that actually you know, takes place, the senior citizen can then actually seek legal redress. And uh, under this you know, legal redress, the, uh, the caregivers you know, can actually have legal action taken against them, including you know, imprisonment. So it's important for uh, not only senior citizens, but people around them neighbors, friends, other families, uh, to be able to know about, you know, this right of the, uh, the you know, maintenance of, you know, Senior Citizens Act and the prevention of, you know, elder abuse so that senior citizens then can then actually, you know, seek necessary legal redress in case, you know, they have problems. Uh, there is a elder helpline. For those of you all, you know, who may not know about this elder helpline, there is an All India Elder Helpline 14567. The number is 14567. And if a senior citizen calls up 14567, he or she can then actually lodge any kind of a redressal or ask for any kind of you no know, advice from you know, this particular helpline. Earlier on in the state of Karnataka, this helpline used to be 1090. 
run by nightingales but now this is an all india you know helpline that's run by the ministry of you know social justice and anybody can actually reach out to this you know particular helpline the last is in terms of the various insurance schemes that older people need to be actually lodged uh, into so there are government schemes schemes like the esi the cghs the yashaswini where it looks at certain you know familial based you know schemes but the most important scheme that we need to bear in mind is the ayushman bharat scheme so in every state as such for bpl families the government of india actually provides up to 5 lakhs of medical coverage and uh, this is you know actually got under the ayushman bharat scheme so one needs to be able to try and find out how they can actually register for this you know particular ayushman bharat scheme and get the benefit of this you know particular scheme for apl families above poverty line families a sum of 1.5 lakhs that is 30% of you know the 5 lakhs would be covered by the state in case they actually have a registration in the apl ayushman bharat scheme now what is also important is the need for awareness among professionals we have a lot of you know uh, patients actually coming across to private hospitals we have a lot of patients coming to government hospitals who are not necessarily aware of uh, these schemes the professionals there also are not aware of these schemes and it's important to you know for us to be able to actually educate such senior citizens coming across and to be able to help them actually enroll as far as these you know schemes are concerned uh, to be able to answer your last bit on setting up community geriatric programs we at st johns actually you know have uh, a program for senior citizens in our rural areas we have around 10 you know different clinics that we actually run on rotation through the month uh, in rural areas in a fixed place they are not camps we have people coming you know with notebooks who are registered with us who actually come across and then seek you know help from us and we give them you know actually free consultations as well as you know subsidized uh, drugs you know in these you know consultations we have around five old age homes four of them you know uh, destitute old age homes you know which we actually take care of so once a month you know we actually have visits you know to these old age homes and you know we take care of the elderly there we have a home health service that we run so we have around uh, 100 plus elderly who are registered with us uh, for a small retainer and uh, we have a doctor and a nurse who visits them you know every month uh, and these are largely elderly who cannot come across to the hospital and lastly we actually have something called the grama hiriyara kendras so we have around uh, five village centers wherein uh, elderly people actually in those villages come across in the morning these are not health centers they are social support centers so people come in the morning uh, they say a prayer they have a glass of milk they do some exercise they sit down and you know engage in some meaningful activity you know with each other uh, in certain centers they actually cook a hot meal in the same center sitting with each other they partake in that meal spend some more time and then go back home to spend with their families so uh, these are some of the community geriatric programs that you know we have actually set up at st johns and uh, i would certainly urge each and every one of the participants on this you know particular uh, webinar we have people from uh, from you know ngos we have people you know from medical colleges uh, i can see you know dr pratibha dr uh, prabha you know from medical colleges uh, various other individuals you know from uh, from you know i mean community advocacy groups uh you all can actually you know try and see if we can actually extend this kind of concept to communities and uh try and see you know in case we can set up you know simple such community geriatric programs for older people living around us and i can assure you that it can certainly make a difference in the long run any kind of you know help that we can afford you know from st johns um i can you know uh, i'll put down my address, uh, my email id you know in the chat box and uh, you're most welcome to you know actually approach us in case you know we can be of any assistance thank you so much have a nice evening um shilpa you can conclude uh, the session shilpa yes ma'am i'm here ah so we yeah. can conclude yeah uh, thank you thank you prithvi sir that explains uh, your award
and uh, you have wonderfully given us a great insight on how best we can help the community. I'm sure Pratibha ma'am, Prabha ma'am and all the eminent dignitaries uh, with us in the panel and uh, of the panel would guide youngsters like us and uh, everyone to set up more uh, community work for the upcoming geriatric programs. So with that, uh, I think uh, we have, uh, sir has already summarized, I would not uh, take much of your time. Uh, I think uh, we can conclude the session. So in uh, overall, yes, uh, the ethical issues, emergency care, we can go ahead and do the needful for the elderly. And the helpline, which sir mentioned, 14567 would answer most of our, mm -hmm. um, at least it, it is an initiating step to address elderly abuse and how do we prevent it and also the caregiver burden. And uh, Prabha ma'am has given a, uh, enlightenment on geriatric palliative care and they do have a course on that also. So I think we all can do great job together and um, looking forward to work with most of you in the coming future. And I thank everyone for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Excellent uh, way of taking the Dr. panel discussion, Shilpa.